This is Talk. I'm your host, Neil deGrasse Tyson, your personal astrophysicist. And tonight, my co-host is the inimitable Maeve Higgins. Maeve! Hi! Maeve. Thank you. Oh, we're doing an elbow bump. An elbow, yeah, 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 to get around the microphone. That's nice. Is that yeah. so that you don't get, like, my germs? <laughs> you get elbow germs only. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe, I keep my elbows so clean. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome back. Thank you. I'm so happy and, to be and here. Since you, I don't think you've been back since you published your book, Mave yeah. Mave in America. Mm-hmm. Now, just so I I blurb this book. You but, did. Will you allow me to read the blurb? Please. I'm going to read the blurb. Yeah, the, the, I. I asked you, I said, Neil, please read this book. You said, must I? <laughs> and I, and you, you agreed to read it, so thank you. So, so here's the blurb. Until space aliens land in America, Maeve Higgins from Ireland <laughs> is the next best thing. She offers fresh <laughs> and insightful perspectives from a faraway place on all we take for granted. Oh, Neil, oh, thank okay. you. <laughs> so good luck, good thank luck on you. that. Thank you, I'm green that, like an alien. <laughs> yeah. Because <laughs> we all know aliens are green, yes. <laughs> um, t- you heard it here first. <laughs> Tonight we are talking about the future of humanity. And there aren't many people you want to do that with because most people don't know what the hell they're talking about. Uh, but tonight, we got one of the deepest thinkers on this subject. We brought in Sir Martin Rees, a friend and colleague of mine from way back. Sir Martin, welcome to Star Talk. Great to be here with you, Neil. Excellent. Th- thanks for doing this. You just came out with a book called On the Future. And you wrote a blurb for it. Yes, <laughs> I got two for one here. Yeah. You have yeah. a side hustle. Yeah. Yeah, a s- yes, yes. <laughs> so, How much did you pay to, him to write your yes. blurb? <laughs> well, he's in very good company. You can see the other people who've written blurbs. Yeah, four got page, some good folks four here. Four pages worth of them, wow. yes. We have Elon, Musk. Elon Musk. Wow. Governor Brown. Governor Brown. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. So I'm going to read my blurb, if I may. Yeah. Okay? From climate change to biotech to artificial intelligence, science sits at the center of nearly all decisions that mm-hmm. civilization confronts to assure its own survival. Martin Rees has created a primer on these issues and what we can do about them so that the next generation will think of us not as reckless custodians of their inheritance, but as brilliant shepherds of their birthright. Wow. That, that was great. That makes people actually want to read the book. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it sounds incredible. So, Martin, let me just give people just a little background. Mm -hmm. Um, I don't know if I've told anyone this publicly, Mm -hmm. but when I was a graduate student, uh, you were eminent now and, like, forever. You've been eminent in my field as an astrophysicist at the University of Cambridge in England, where the original Cambridge was from. (laughs) and uh, (laughs) Proto-Cambridge. Starter Cambridge. (laughs) Uh, And... As a graduate student at one of our sort of society conferences, I think I had a poster paper where you, you, you're not sort of far enough along for them to let you give a talk. So you just you put your paper up on a poster and you wait for people to come by. It's a passive delivery of your, of your science. And you came up to my paper and you looked at it and you asked me questions about it. And you didn't have to do that. And, and you were... I felt that my future as a participating scientist was blessed, if you will, <laughs> by your presence. <laughs> and so I just want to thank you. Well, I don't know what you, how often you do that, yes. but I just want to thank you because what may have been little for you was big for me at the time. Well, great. And now it's, uh, it's the other way around. It's great for me to be with you today. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, but, but then, of course, you were at Princeton. Uh, university and uh, uh-huh. you gave this wonderful course, which I didn't attend, but I read the book about it. Oh, yep. you did? Okay, yeah, yeah. yes, I, yeah. Mm-hmm. Ultimately, I, I mm. postdoc at Princeton, then I yep. taught mm-hmm. there. Mm-hmm. Uh, but so, just want to thank you for all the work Great. you've done. Just mm-hmm. and you're like, he's like the last gentleman. Oh, right. <laughs> in the world. Oh, yeah. 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 Well, yeah. that's really important, and that's really good for science too, because I think yes. yeah. ethics and morals are needed in science. Right, right. Yeah, that's yeah. just it's, mm-hmm. it's so. Yeah. I'm just saying, 
They, aren't, and, they don't make them like him yeah, anymore. Yes. And, and you had a good book, and uh, but for you, the smaller your books are, the better they sell. Yeah, it turns out people yeah. don't like to read, I think, at the That's end right. of the day. Mm -hmm. you know? yeah. yeah, your tweets, though. <laughs> oh, yeah, 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 so now it's in the... It's tweets. That's, yeah. that's right. That's right. People yeah. read, you know, two hundred character yes. tweets. I love the image of you. Were you like in a row of graduate students, and then Sir Reese is just sort of walking by, and you're like, "Pick me!" <laughs> it's like The Bachelor. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm sure he spoke to more graduate students yeah. than me on, on, on that day. So let me just go down your your sort of four line bio here. Astronomer Ro Royal. This is didn't Edmund Halley have this or something? Well, that's right. Of course, it was the person who ran the Grenz Observatory, but that became a museum from the 1960s onwards when, of course, we could have telescopes under clear skies uh -huh. elsewhere, but they kept a title. I see. And, uh, so I have this just as a title. And there's, there's only no, one Astronomer Royal. Only one, yes, mm -hmm. but there were no duties. It's just oh. honorary, and I like to say the duties are so exiguous I can do them posthumously. I need never give up. I need never give up. We don't yeah. want that to happen um, too soon. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Also, I'm sure somebody else would like the role. You <laughs> take it with you into right, the afterlife. Yes. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yes. Wow. So, astronomer world. That's so. But I, my day job is as a professor at Cambridge. And professor yes. at Cambridge. Yeah. So, <clears throat> you were previously master at Trinity College. Yes. Director for the Institute of Astronomy mm -hmm. at. Cambridge University, uh, and you are currently uh, a professor, that we have similar ranks yep, as yep, we do yep. here, mm -hmm. professor of astronomy yes, uh, at University of Cambridge. Yes, yes, and a member of the UK House of Lords, so I'm a bit of a politician too. I got the member of the UK House of Lords mm -hmm. and former president of the Royal Society. Which is like your National Academy. National yeah. Academy, yeah. good, okay. Uh, our National Academy is where scientists elect the most eminent among us, so it's a peer voted representation of who and mm -hmm. what we are internationally and to the government especially. I see. To, and the House of Lords that. is like... I'm getting there, I'm getting there. Okay. okay, so now, <laughs> so previously you were knighted. Mm -hmm. That's when you became Sir Martin Rees. Right, yes. And mm -hmm. you actually stand there in front of the Queen and she holds a sword where she could tap your shoulder or cut your head off <laughs> That's depending right. on and her she motion. Did, she did the former. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, <laughs> but, but, then, but then I got an upgrade to the House of Lords. Okay, yeah, okay, okay, so wait, so yeah. once you're knighted, then you are Sir. Yes, yes. Okay, now in the old days, that was became hereditary, right? Was that not true anymore? That's not true. There was something called a baronet, which was hereditary, yeah. Okay. But Lords were hereditary, and they're not anymore. Okay, so... You have to earn it. Well, in some sense, you have to earn it. If you look at m most of them, uh, they haven't really earned it. <laughs> and uh, I would say that's... Oh, he's a, talking smack. No, so, so being in the House of Lords is a privilege, but not an honor. Ah. No, oh, interesting distinction. Yep. Yes, mm -hmm. it is. I hadn't mm -hmm. thought about separating those two. Mm -hmm. And so don't you have to have some plot of land that you govern? You don't really. I mean, you have to uh, designate a sort of area. And I picked Ludlow, which is the hometown in the west of England where I grew up. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. So you're lord of that patch of land? Yeah, but they don't recognize me. It doesn't mean anything there. <laughs> you, yeah. Can you just knock into any of the houses? <laughs> no, 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 no. Give me some no of your food. There. I'm hungry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Don't you know who I am? No, no rights there, but uh, for historical reasons, you have to have a name of a place associated with you. I see. Mm -hmm. yeah. okay, well, so thank, you, thank you for not choosing Ireland. <laughs> 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 so, so you're lord of Ludlow? Yes. Okay, very cool. I like the mm. alliteration mm. there. Um, this is not your. And that doesn't mean I'm a Luddite. Oh, nice. Very <laughs> right. good. Lord of Ludo, not a Luddite. Not a Luddite. <laughs> right. On his iPhone as we speak. Yeah. No, you're not. <laughs> yeah. um, so, this is not your first rodeo. On the future, you've got our cosmic habitat. Uh, just six numbers. Yes. I, that was one of my favorites because mm -hmm. people didn't know how dependent so much of our understanding of the universe was on just a few measurements that we were mm -hmm. actively making then mm -hmm. and still. And our final hour, I, I didn't read our final hour. This sounds, that doesn't sound happy. Well, it, it, was, it was entitled in England, Our Final Century, question mark. They took the question mark off and uh, you Americans retitled it, Our Final Hour, because you like instant gratification <laughs> <That's right. laughs> and the reverse. We like fast yeah. food, fast. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's incredible. That's so but, dramatic. But that was, in, in fact, yeah. a precursor of the present book. Um, and uh, um, it really addresses um, 
you know, some of the big questions about what's happening this century and why mm. this century is special even among the 45 million centuries where the Earth existed. Well, let me lead, lead off with a question here because uh, why should someone listen to an astrophysicist? Why not a futurist? Why, why is your insight deeper or more... Um, accurate than a futurist might offer us in possibly writing the same titled book? Well, I don't recognize futurists as a real profession. I don't <laughs> yeah. think... Yeah, they're uh, so uh, irritating. Uh, <laughs> yes, I, I don't even... Think, but but, uh, but ob <laughs> ob obviously, um, I'm Depends not... Because of what a, they predict. <laughs> yeah, I'm not an astrologer. I have no crystal ball, mm -hmm. uh, so we can't make reliable predictions. But, Typical Gemini. But do, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> there, there's some predictions, um, but uh, uh, all I would say is that I could do a better job than economists can do. Oh. Mm. Is it because you... Have you have knowledge of the laws of physics and how they shape what is possible and what is not possible? Well, I think so. I mean, just, just to t take two examples from my book, um, we can't predict the very far future, but we can predict, as I think you'd agree, that by 2050 the world will be more crowded, 9 billion people, mm -hmm. and the world will be warmer. CO2 emissions. Okay, do we it. need you for that, though? I mean, come on now. No, we don't. No, <laughs> okay. no, no, no. But 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 certainly, people haven't listened. So the more people who can repeat these these things and uh, uh, say we I need see. to prepare for them better. But of course, what we can't predict, whether you're a futurist or anything else, um, is technology that far ahead. Because uh, um, the um, smartphone would have seen magic. 25 years ago, Completely. and the social implications of social media and all that. And therefore, when we look to 2050 and beyond, uh, we've got to um, keep our minds at least ajar to what now seems science fiction. And I discuss things, but accept that they are very uncertain. I definitely look to astrophysicists for future guidance because of the scope that you have. Well, we do think in deep time. I mean, yeah. we, we think deep backwards yeah, yeah. and forwards. Right. Right. Well, I think the one, the one special thing is that, you know, most people now, unless they're fundamentalists or in parts of the Islamic world, are aware of the four billion years of the past that's led mm -hmm. to, to uh, our emergence, our evolution. But I think... And there's plenty of people here in America who are still... Well, that's what I he's know. saying. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Yes. yes. Um, but, but, I mean, e even educated people who accept evolution and all that, mm -hmm. they tend to think that we humans are the end point, the culmination. But I think as astronomers, we can't take that view because we know that the future is at least as long. The Earth uh, will exist for another six billion years before the sun dies, and the universe may go on expanding forever. And I like to quote Woody Allen, who said, eternity oh. is very long, especially towards the end. <laughs> and so so uh, uh, we, we should think of ourselves as, as a, a stage. And a the theme of my book is that we are a very important transition stage because two things are going to happen this century. One is uh, spreading beyond the Earth for the first time, and the other, perhaps, you mean, is... Uh, uh, you mean colonizing other, yeah, other yeah, locations yeah, in space? Yeah, yes, uh, and another <clears throat> thing is, of course, uh, having the, uh, the power to as it were, redesign ourselves by genetic techniques and cyborg... Uh, techniques and interfaces mm. with the electronics. Like so, more than just hair transplants. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah that, that's right. And um, uh, so that is something which is special this century, and which makes the future more, more unpredictable, but uh, more fascinating. So this is a crucial century. Mm -hmm. And of course, um, those exciting possibilities should be in our minds. But the downside is that because of this powerful technology, there are extra risks which we didn't have in the past. Mm -hmm. So here, here's a question I've been yeah, meaning yeah. to ask you mm -hmm. ever since I read this book. Mm -hmm. There's a famous quote from from Ray Bradbury when asked. I, I'm paraphrasing. I was afraid you were going to quote Woody mm -hmm. Allen too. <laughs> no. <laughs> uh, uh, when a I'm paraphrasing, mm -hmm. but when asked, why do you write such dystopian stories mm -hmm. about our future? Mm -hmm. Is this what you think will happen to us? And he says, no, I write these stories so that you know to avoid them. Yes. And so let me ask you, there are restorative forces in society that tell me that I think we will never land where dystopic storytellers tell us. You know, remember in, in, in Soylent Green, mm. you know, we're eating, I mean, just, just pick any, any any movie, 
any movie where there's a mm. descent of humanity to some mm -hmm. rock bottom, aren't there forces that will restore it? Well, we hope so. And of course, um, Ray Bradbury's right that if we are aware of the bad things that can happen, that's a motivation to try and prevent them. And I think. But one historians of might disagree because the whole time they're telling us about awful things that happened in the past, and we're just like, all yeah. right, keep it down over yeah, the there. Things that actually, yeah, that yeah. actually yeah, did happen really in the past. Well, th 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 that's right. But I think um, uh, there's a set of uh, concerns which I highlight in my book about the downsides of ever more powerful technology. And. Um, we are aware that of, of two types of concern. One is the pressures we're putting on the uh, human habitat by mm. the growing population, more demanding of energy resources. So we're risking uh, some tipping points that uh, cause lots of extinctions and make mm. the... Uh, possibly uh, our own extinction. Possibly yeah. our own extinction, yeah. Um, so that's one class. But the other type of threat is because even a few people are now empowered to create by error or by design um, a consequence that could uh, cascade globally. We are familiar with what cyber attacks could do mm -hmm. and uh, they're going to get more serious um, and also uh, similar concerns about misuse of biotech. And so those are two technologies which are getting very powerful. And um, uh, in fact in Cambridge we've set up a group to uh, study these issues because even though huge numbers of people are studying small risks like uh, uh, plane crashes, carcinogens in food, low radiation doses, etc. Not very many people are thinking about these low probability but catastrophic consequence risks. And uh, in our group in Cambridge, we feel that if we can reduce the probability of those by one part in a thousand, we've earned our keep mm. because the stakes are so high. They must be the most fun people at a dinner party. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. When everyone's like, you know, well, like, I don't yeah. know if this chicken is cooked, and they're yeah, like, yeah. well, I can tell you there's a something's coming for all of us. Don't <laughs> well, worry well, about the chicken. Well, we can have to give good plots to these dystopian authors. <laughs> yes, totally. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I see. So they, they should mine your deliberations yeah. and come up with stories yeah. For, yeah, yeah. To, for future movies. Yes, yes. <laughs> and so, of course, uh, um, we, we do plan these scenarios and the university like uh, our Cambridge can convene experts to decide what is complete science fiction and what is a serious threat. Mm. And uh, you have experts in all the different branches of human yeah, yeah, investigation yeah, that's right. that can weigh in. Yes, and I think they have an obligation healthy. to weigh in, in my opinion, because uh, mm. uh, the experts are very often wrong, but they're more likely to be able to see a threat before the average person. And your can. single mm. biggest threat that you think of is what? Single biggest. Well, in the short term, I worry about bio and cyber uh -huh. because I think they're going to uh, make governance very difficult because there'll be the tension between privacy, liberty, and security. Yes, uh, because an um, eternal tension, actually. Yeah, but it's getting worse because um, uh, you know um, I like to say the global village will have its village idiots and they will have a global range. So we can't be so benign and tolerant oh, as they were yeah. in the past. The local village idiots. Yeah, they'll have all the global village the wall. Power. I mean, yeah, the yeah. world. The power that they have. Yeah, yeah. Wow. Yeah. They're not yeah. just like... Spiders. Well, I mean, this, this yeah. is true, obviously, by uh, cyber yeah. already. And uh, I think with uh, biotechnology being... Um, so widely dispersed, I mean, biohacking is even a student sport, mm -hmm. uh, th then we have to worry right. about yeah, this. It's a sport. It became yeah, a sport. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yes. Uh, and, um, uh, you know, we say we can regulate these things, but regulating these techniques globally is as hopeless as regulating the drug laws globally or the mm -hmm. tax laws globally. Yeah. And uh, not even the Americans have managed to do those. And, and your biggest concern 50, 100 years out? Um, well, I, I worry then about the environmental effects, mm. okay. um, and of, of course, uh, we don't know how powerful computers and AI will be then, and we've got to cope with that. Mm -hmm. and, mm. Okay. Well, we got to take a break, and when we come back, we will take questions from our fan base Good. that are all directed on this very subject. And Maeve, you've got the questions. I've got the questions. Haven't you haven't yet. seen them. Neither of us have seen yep. them, right. but they're all going to him. Yes. <laughs> okay. okay, get when, ready. When Star Talk returns. And I bluff my way. <laughs> <laughs> uh, this is actually a Cosmic Queries edition of Star Talk with our special guest, Sir Lord Martin Rees. Squarespace, 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 Squarespace. We can't get enough of Squarespace here at Star Talk Radio. That's because they've been supporting us for a very long time. And we love telling people about Squarespace because you'll love using them. Turn your dream into a reality. 
Use Squarespace. Squarespace makes it easier than ever to launch your passion project. It doesn't make a difference what it is. Starting a new business, showcasing work, publishing content, selling products, no matter what it is that you do online, Squarespace is the tool for you. They have these beautiful templates. They are created by world-class designers, and it gives you the ability to customize your look with just a few clicks. The only limit is your imagination as to how you want to put things together to create a beautiful website. Squarespace's powerful e-commerce functionality lets you sell anything you want online. And the analytics help you grow your site in real time. Everything is optimized for mobile right out of the box and there's nothing to patch or upgrade ever. And if you ever have a problem, Squarespace's 24-7 award-winning customer support is always there. I guess that is why they call it 24-7 customer support, Chuck. Head to squarespace.com slash startalk for a free trial. And when you're ready to launch, use the offer code startalk to save 10% off your first purchase of a website or domain. That's squarespace.com slash startalk, offer code startalk. Support for Star Talk Radio comes from our friends at Rocket Mortgage by Quicken Loans, America's premier home purchase lender. Let's talk about buying a home. You know it can be one of the most important decisions you'll ever make, but today's fluctuating interest rates can leave you with higher payments, turning a great experience into an anxious one. That's why Quicken Loans created their exclusive buying power process. Here's how it works. They check your income, assets, and credit to give you a verified approval, which means you have the strength of a cash buyer. Once verified, you qualify for their exclusive rate shield approval and they'll lock your interest rate in for up to 90 days. If the rates go up, your rate stays the same. But if the rates go down, you get to keep the lower rate. Either way, you win. To get started, go to rocketmortgage.com slash startalk. Rate shield approval only valid in certain 30-year purchase transactions. Additional conditions or exclusions may apply based on a Quicken Loans data in comparison to public data records. Equal housing lender licensed in all 50 states. NMLSconsumeraccess.org number 3030. We're back on Talk, Cosmic Queries Edition, on the future prospects for humanity, which happens to be the exact title of Sir Martin Rees's book, a longtime friend and colleague of mine in astrophysics from the University of Cambridge. And I've got with me is my co-host, Maeve. Yes. Maeve, you've got questions. I've got the questions. The, the question is, does he have the answers? Let's see. Let's find <laughs> out. Okay, who do we have? Okay, this comes from Facebook. Uh, Kato's Clover asks... Do you think that one day we'll have a worldwide united science and or space organization? Ooh, that's a good yes. one. Well, of course, science is a sort of global culture. Protons and proteins are the same everywhere in the world. And so that's why science is valuable for straddling political divides and divides of faith. We can be in common. And of course, sometimes we have to work together because we need big bits of equipment. Mm -hmm. Telescopes are not funded by a single country, etc. So you but love taking turns to use telescopes in some cases? Yeah, we do. Yeah. We, do. Yeah. we do. Yeah. 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 We do. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. And the Europeans. And we're very polite about it, too. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> You're not like, shove over. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we don't fight it on the line. But the Europeans are building the world's biggest telescope, 39 mm -hmm. meter diameter. And uh, we, we work together to fund that sort of thing. Mm. Um, but I think also the challenges of the application of science for health and energy and all that need to be tackled globally, as does climate change. Has there been a problem in the past, though, with scientists not sharing information and the competitive nature? And Well, I mean, I think obviously sometimes there's competition, uh, to be first, but I think scientists are far more cooperative than most people. Um, they share the culture mm -hmm. and they, they realize that it's a cumulative endeavor. Everyone adds their brick to a big structure, as it were. I think the, the lesson there is scientists are human like everybody else. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yes. But at the end of the day, we... We serve a higher goal. <laughs> <laughs> you can't even say it with a straight face. <laughs> no, no, no. At the end of the day, either I'm right or Smartin is wrong. Or Sir Martin is right and I'm wrong, or we're both wrong. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay? Mm -hmm. yeah. And we both know that going into the conversation. And yes. for so much dialogue in the world, mm. there's conflict to the point of bloodshed because opposite sides think they are, have the absolute truth. Yes. And 
But that's partly because uh, uh, science deals with the external world, whereas sort of ethics and morality and politics are things where... And religion. Yeah. 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 All right. Mm. Um, this one is from Facebook too, Tavis C. Ali. How do you think future generations will judge our actions regarding climate change? Um, well, I mean, uh, at the moment, I think uh, they'll have a lot to blame us for because uh, we realize that we've inherited a huge amount from earlier centuries, mm -hmm. not just cathedrals and all that, but all our infrastructure from the last century or two. And the main concern is that when we have far more benefits than any previous generation, if we leave a depleted world mm -hmm. for the future, that will be a t terrible legacy. And that's a serious threat if, in fact, we don't address these questions soon. It's an interesting point because in the United States, mm -hmm. one of the great legacies of the country were all the pro the mega projects from the Work Project Administration. That's right. WPA. Yes, yes. yes. Period. Mm -hmm. The Hoover Dam, yep. uh, aqueducts, um, mm -hmm. roads. There was just a huge mm -hmm. movement to build an infrastructure for the country. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, we only recently, here in, the, in New York City, we only recently twinned our water pipes from the reservoirs up in the in the mountains and we would say oh Lord, why are they breaking they were made a hundred years ago yeah. Yeah. <laughs> they yeah. were they're a hundred years yeah. old oh yeah, my yeah. gosh yes that's right and i think more more generally um even though our cosmic horizons in time are so much larger our planning horizon has got too short <laughs> you don't plan ahead even 20 or 30 years right mm -hmm. right right mm. Um, so, again, this is on climate. This is from Tim Shaw uh, mm -hmm. through Patreon. What kind of climate... Patreon, those are the people who actually pay. They are. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> All right, go on. What kind of climate change influence disaster will need to happen before the majority of the world takes serious action on climate change? That's a good question. Mm. I'm yes. optimistic that the human race possesses everything we need to find climate change effectively, but I'm pessimistic when I see the current trend, especially in politics. Yes, but well, I'm pessimistic too, and I think mm -hmm. the problem is that politicians think parochially and short term, whereas climate change has to be uh, thought in terms of benefiting people in the long term and helping people in remote parts of the world. My personal view is that the only effective thing is not to have carbon taxes and things, but to accelerate research and development into all kinds of clean energy. That's a win-win situation because the countries that develop it will have a huge market and countries like India, which need more power, will then be able to afford to leapfrog to clean energy and not build coal-fired power stations. So I think to promote R&D in energy and things like batteries and storage and all that on a level closer to the level of research in defense and in health is the prime mm. thing we should do. Oh, imagine if the US spent all the money they spend on defense, on R&D for clean energy. Oh, yeah. yeah, wouldn't that be great? <laughs> Isn't that like billions of dollars? It's trillions. Trillions. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's That's over, more over than seven. billions. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, trillions. Yeah. trillions is more than billions, sir. <laughs> yeah, but that would be great, wouldn't it? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Mm. Good idea. All right. Um, so, there's so many questions about space travel. Okay. Everybody Let's wants to get on. out of here. Yep. Bring it Bring it on. Um, yes. So, Gabby Matei, uh, she, through Google+, Plus, in the near future, will space travel be possible for everybody? Well, not for everybody, but for a lot. But it, it's interesting. Um, uh, I'm old enough to remember uh, the Apollo program. Mm -hmm. And at that time, I thought that 10 years afterwards, there'd be footprints on Mars. But of yeah. course, there weren't because the uh, US government had spent 4% of its federal budget on the Apollo program and there was no motive because it was done for superpower mm -hmm. rivalry reasons. Um, of course, we know what's happening now. Um, my personal view is that if I was an American, I wouldn't support... NASA spending any money on manned space flights. That's because I think it should be left to these private Women. companies. Women <laughs> space flights. Women space flights. Yeah, okay. Um, and uh, it, it should be left to the private companies um, uh, like, like uh, SpaceX and Blue Origin. Um, mm -hmm. And that's because they can take risks. The trouble with NASA, Elon Musk. Blurbed yep. his book. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> yep, 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 yep. But 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 the trouble is that um, uh, NASA is very risk averse. I mean, the shuttle failed twice in 135 launches. Yeah. Each was a national trauma. Whereas adventurers and test pilots are prepared to take higher risks than that. So mm -hmm. I think the future lies in cut price, high risk ventures, bankrolled by these uh, 
private companies. Um, and I hope very much that there will be a community of people like that living on Mars by the end of the century. But I disagree with Musk and with my late colleague Stephen Hawking in that I don't think mass emigration is ever going to happen, ever be sensible, because nowhere in the solar system is as clement as the top of Everest or the South Pole, and it's a dangerous delusion to think we can solve the Earth's problems by going uh, to Mars. Uh, dealing with climate change is hard, but it's a doddle compared to terraforming Mars. I, I agree 100%, and I'm publicly I want to say that I'm opposed mm -hmm. to mass migration, but yes. I just, I don't mind if we all want to live on Mars, but we need to, I don't think people fully understand what that involves. And it, it does seem that, crazy. Right. It seems like if you mess up your, you know, your bedroom, then you move house. Well, like so, so watch like, what happens. So yeah. if we're really going to ship a billion people to Mars, you because something bad happened on Earth, yeah. because a lot of the argument, mm -hmm. especially put forth by your eminent colleague, the late Stephen Hawking, yes, yes. Mm. The, the argument was, and you can see the argument, it makes a good headline, you want to be a multi-planet species yeah. in case something really bad happens yes. on mm. one of the planets so your species prop can still propagate. Mm. Yeah, yeah. Okay, I get that. Yeah. But if you want to ship a billion people to Mars to protect humans, terraform it in advance to do so, it seems to me, whatever it takes to terraform Mars... Like the resources. The and, yeah. You could terraform Earth back into Earth, if you would yes. messed up all the reasons. <laughs> yeah, yes, <laughs> but, but, but I think he's the wrong way around. I mean, I think there will be these crazy pioneers on Mars. Yes. And rather than terraforming the, the planet, th they will modify themselves to adapt. Because by the end of a century, we'll have uh, genetic modification techniques and cyborg techniques. So my view is that a post-human era will be pioneered by these people on Mars because they've got every incentive to adapt themselves to a hostile environment. They're away from all the regulators, and so uh, th they will evolve into a different species very quickly. And They're so away from the biological regulators, so they can actually introduce yeah. biological variation yeah. Yes. suitable for the Martian environment. Yes, uh, and maybe at that stage they can download their brains into electronic form, etc. Mm -hmm. And that means that uh, um, the species will have its descendants uh, who will... Uh, be um, uh, generated by those oh, people man, on Mars. Oh man, if I downloaded my brain, it's so glitchy <laughs> and anxiety ridden. <laughs> yeah. I don't know if we want to replicate that. <laughs> no, well, that's a separate question. Whether, whether, whether we'll deal with that in another <laughs> show, man. Whether it would still be you. <laughs> mm. I don't know. Yeah, yeah. Mm. Maybe mm. me, but what, like just in silver body form. Yeah, because all what future I'm people are dressed in silver. That's what yeah. I'm saying. <laughs> oh my god. Okay, I more. Another, another um, one. What else? Yeah. This one is from Chris Ryu. Fast forward a decade, a, um, or a few decades, and imagine this permanent Mars colony that we were talking about. Mm. Assuming that NASA were the ones responsible, what changes do you think that that would mean to the role of NASA? Well, I think if NASA were responsible, we'd have to go on. But my my line, uh, which I discuss in, in, my, in my book on the future, mm -hmm. uh, is that um, the role of NASA would be just that of a... Uh, an airport rather than an airline, as it were, mm. in that they may provide some basic facilities, um, but it'll be the private companies that uh, um, provide the spacecraft and take the people prepared to accept high risks. So I think NASA will be phased out and it'll be public money not spent and private money spent. As you may know, the FAA mm -hmm. has recent legislation. I don't know if it's been fully voted on, but it's been... There's not much resistance to it where mm -hmm. they will now be the shepherds of the future space launch sites, spaceports. Yep. And mm -hmm. you can propose to have a spaceport. Yes. And they would be responsible for checking the safety of it. Yes. The safety of the downrange launches. Is there yes. what, or yep. the, um, the safety yes. of craft that were launched? Mm -hmm. So this is a first step yes. in precisely what but you're saying. But they shouldn't be too stringent because they should remember that some people are prepared to go on some one way tickets and people like Steve Fawcett. And these guys who go hang gliding in Yosemite, mm. they take very high risk. And they ought to allow people like that to risk their own lives. We and we cheer them we on. We interviewed someone yeah. who, was, who wanted to go on these one-way trips to Mars. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we, but, had him, we had him in our show. And I said, well, what is your, like wife think about this? She said, oh, she encouraged it. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Mm. Said, Have you thought this through? She's, she's doing a GoFundMe. Send well, to Mars, I mean, come on. Uh, well, Elon Musk said he wants to die on Mars but not on impact. 
Oh, oh, good. That's yeah. good. Okay. <laughs> um, well, I think... Okay, time for one Mark, more quick question. Okay, yeah, I think good. it might. We have answered Mark Fesco's question from Facebook, where he asks, will companies such as SpaceX eventually make NASA obsolete? Mm. Yeah, but let me, let me give a counter mm. argument there. Mm-hmm. Um, to do something first... Yes. ...that's expensive and dangerous mm-hmm. doesn't really come with a business model. That's a very mm. short venture capitalist meeting. Yes, oh, so yes. Elon, what are you doing? I'm put humans on Mars. How much will it cost? Mm. I don't know, a trillion yeah. dollars. Uh, mm-hmm. Is it dangerous? Yes. Will people die? Probably. Yes. What's the return on investment? Nothing. Mm, yeah. uh, so how do you do that first? I, I, my research of the history of this exercise yes. says that governments do this first. And then they find the trade wins and the patents are, are, yeah, are yeah. granted. And then private enterprise comes up behind that. But I'm saying you would never have that grandiose goal of sending a million people. You would just uh, have a few pioneers who would go. I mean, the point is that s- space is it's not like you know, climate change where governments have to coordinate. It doesn't have to be everyone agreeing. It can be just one corporation doing it. Right. right. One individual. And therefore and there's much greater, much greater freedom. Much greater freedom. Creativity and, uh, and decision. Yes, and uh, a, a greater capacity for accepting risks. Good point, because... The FAA doesn't want people dying, no. and so that might so that might actually be a, a delaying force mm, yep. in, compared to what you're yes, describing. Yes, yes, that's right. So he, he wants the Wild West yeah. space yes, yes. exploration. Yes, the, yes. That's what he wants. All the yeah, yeah. bad kids who smoke around the back of the school. <laughs> 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. The risk takers. The, the, yes, the bad yes. boys. Yeah. Yes, yes. All right, we got to take our next break, and when we come back, more Cosmic Queries on the future of humanity with Sir Martin Rees and Maeve Higgins when we return. Thanks to two years of research and development and multiple improvements in design, performance, and comfort, Bombas are the most comfortable socks in the history of feet. They're certainly the most comfortable socks in the history of my feet. With an arch support system that provides extra support where you need it most and a cushioned footbed that's reinforced for comfort without added bulkiness, Bombas feel like a hug around your foot. Not to mention, Bombas stay-up technology ensures that your socks stay in place without leaving a mark. And the super soft cotton material makes you never want to take them off. So whether you're a runner, a power walker, or a power lounger, there's a pair of Bombas that'll add comfort to your life. I've been wearing Bombas for years, long before I ever talked about them here on Star Talk. And I have to tell you, they're my most favorite socks ever. Go to bombas.com slash star talk and use the code star talk for 20% off your first order. That's bombas.com slash star talk code star talk for 20% off your first order. Believe me, your feet will thank you and you will thank me. We're back for our final segment, Cosmic Queries, The Future of Humanity, uh, featuring the recent book by my friend and colleague, Sir Martin Rees, On the Future Prospects for Humanity. So uh, let me just lead off. She's got her list of questions from, yes. our, mm-hmm. from our people. But uh, I'm just curious, is there, um, how important will science... Uh, th- I think I know the answer to this, but I want to hear it from you. Mm-hmm. How important will science literacy be going forward as science becomes so much more centered in decisions we have to make about our own fate? Well, I think it's crucially important that everyone should have a feel for science. That's why uh, things like your outreach are so important because so many of the decisions we have to take are on energy, health, environment, and You need to have some feel for science, not to be bamboozled by bad statistics and things like that. And so it's very important that everyone should have a feel for science. But also, it's part of our culture, isn't it? And, um, uh, you know, everyone wants to know about our place in the universe. And, of course, nothing fascinates kids more than dinosaurs, Mm -hmm. uh, uh, even though they're completely irrelevant. So science... (laughs) No, but it's important for educators. They, but, but they you know tend to think you have to make uh, things relevant. I win that don't. argument. I yeah. said, yeah. one of our asteroids took out your dinosaurs. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So we're done here. So dinosaurs in space are what fascinate kids. <laughs> All of these eight-year-old children just weeping, listening <laughs> yeah. to the show. <laughs> um, right, so what else you got? This is our last segment, so make them good. Okay. 
Are you ready? This is from Jake A. Wynn. Uh, he got onto us through Instagram and he asks, what's the next E equals MC squared? Meaning, what do you anticipate will next shake the foundations of physics on that level of wow factor? Ooh, nice. Right. Um, well, of course, the biggest wow is now coming not from physics, um, but from biology, mm. um, understanding the brain and the complications. And uh, I'd like to say that physics is the easy subject. Um, uh, stars and atoms are far easier to understand than even an insect. So the big challenge is to understand uh, life and the brain. But if you want to ask about physics, then uh, the next big step is to unify the very large and the very small, to unify what Einstein did uh, with the uh, physics of atoms in the micro world, what's called quantum theory. And um, until we have that, we won't understand empty space in the bedrock sense. And uh, we astronomers worry about something called dark energy which is a force latent in empty space. I think my ex-boyfriend had that dark energy. Dark energy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, but, that. but, uh, are, are we, but that's a big challenge for physics. Is there some state of the universe that is on the brink of collapse and we don't know it? Well, if you don't know it, I can't answer your question. <laughs> um, but, uh, um, but, 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 no, but, you could be, we, could be, we could be walking along the edge of some because cliff, and the cliff is not visible to yeah. us until you step there, and yeah. then everything collapses. Well, I mean, th th that's certainly possible. But another point, uh, I, which I make in, 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 my, in my book on the future, is that um, there may be some important aspects of reality which our brains just can't cope with. I mean, a monkey can't understand quantum theory, and likewise, there may be uh, deep issues which are just beyond our brains and have to await these post-humans. Do you and they, mean may, like uh, when they may answer that sort of question. Do you mean like That's when... That's after they some... make us their pets. <laughs> 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 yeah, yes. We're going to be their pets. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh. Kid, it's not all that bad. Yeah. No, we'll just be yeah. rescues. Mm. Mm. <laughs> um, rescues. But do you mean like we can't understand what's happening in front of our eyes? Like something like, remember when some people saw ships for the first time, they mm -hmm. just didn't see them because they didn't know what they were? Mm -hmm. That's what you mean? Yes. Yikes. Mm. And of course that's relevant to aliens and SETI because they may be so different from us that we wouldn't recognize their manifestations. Oh my God. <laughs> um, okay, so this is about the Hadron Collider. Isn't there a part of the Large Hadron Collider that emits a magnetic field stronger than that of Earth? Why can't we somehow place something similar on our future spaceships? That's from Ramon Hamilton. Oh, to protect us from... Uh, from solar radiation. Yeah. Ah, yes, yes. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. Is that? Well, m maybe we can. People mm -hmm. talk about talk mm -hmm. about that, but you need uh, a so-called superconductor, or you need power to maintain the magnetic field. But certainly, radiation damage is uh, uh, an important constraint on manned spacecraft, and that's why uh, uh, Dennis Tito had the idea of sending people uh, around Mars and back. 500 days and his favorite crew uh, a middle-aged couple to be cooped up for 500 days happily and to be old enough not to care about a radiation dose <laughs> to become sterile at yep. the end yep. Oh my yep. God. <laughs> yep. and also a middle-aged couple they're happy to sit in silence together for long <laughs> yep. periods that's of right. time that's right that's perfect yeah yeah <laughs> Yeah. Um, so don't volunteer yet. <laughs> uh, so yeah. So this that would it's an interesting fact, and the point Sir Martin was making mm -hmm. was that you, you, you know, every pound, every kilogram matters mm -hmm. that you're sending into space, and so mm -hmm. if you're going to have a system that creates a magnetic field around your ship, mm -hmm. there's the weight of that versus the weight of what might just simply be shielding. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, so a whole shielding. lot of lead. Yeah. 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 Yep. That was a good question. Yeah, what mm -hmm. else? What else you have? Um, given, this is from Matthew Belitho, given that a particle's interaction with the Higgs field is what gives its mass, is it conceivable that in future, when we understand this interaction more thoroughly, we could devise a machine by which we could completely nullify a spaceship and its contents interaction with the Higgs field, rendering it completely massless and therefore capable of light speed and beyond. Whoa! Uh, <laughs> Whoa! That's just a, say, yeah, just it's say yes. Just say yes. Just say yes. Yeah. <laughs> I, I think you don't know. I mean, I should say we can't conceive of what might happen in a far future. That's a very kind. <laughs> that's, a, that's a very kind. Oh, answer. that no, that, that, I, I, that needs a bigger brain than we. I'm, so, I'm just going to yep. say yes to that. You're going to say I, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Well, wait. <laughs> except uh, you have to watch out, of course, because for almost everything we've discussed, mm -hmm. there's that off ramp 
of the weaponization of that new technology. Yeah. Yep. And so you can imagine if you had control over the mass of something, yeah. and yes. that became weaponized. Troublemaker. What, yeah. Yes. Well, I mean, one of the themes of my, my book on the future is that uh, the stakes are getting high because every new invention has benefits and a downside, um, but they're getting bigger. Mm -hmm. But the consequence, yeah. so a knife can, can cut your food mm -hmm. or kill someone, but a knife can't kill a thousand people. Mm, right. A thousand people will kill you before mm -hmm. your knife kills a yeah, thousand yes, people, yes. but other kinds of weaponry, that equation is different. Yep, that's yeah, right. Yeah. And there's a risk of error as well as uh, design. Right, right. Um, this one is about uh, communicating, I think, with, with aliens. Mm -hmm. Timothy Colnan. Um, has anybody thought to watch for coded patterns in starlight dips that could be used as communication? As if a very advanced civilization intentionally put large objects into orbit around a local star to create such an obvious message that distant intelligent observers would recognize it as a message. I could imagine our civilization attempting something like that in the future, if we could. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, of course, uh, th there was this object called Tabby's Star, where people thought something about this might be happening. But it's primitive communication, rather like smoke signals. Yes. Uh, there. Yeah. Um, but or I, crying I, statues. Yeah. But, but my, my, my view is that if SETI searches detect anything... SETI search for extraterrestrial intelligence. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, if they detect something, it won't be anything like our civilization. It'll be some sort of machine created by some long-dead civilization, and it might be sending out some sort of transmission, mm -hmm. but it's unlikely that it's a message we could decode. So I'm pessimistic about mm -hmm. being able to decode a message. Because if they're in any way smarter than us, Hmm. Their simplest thoughts will transcend our deepest thoughts. They and, might, so they might not be interested in sending a message, but we might find evidence for something which is manifestly artificial. And that in itself would be, of course, a big breakthrough. And of course, you were around for the, for the discovery of the pulsar, correct? You were, yeah, I was a student then, yes. You were a student mm -hmm. at, yes, yes. at University of Cambridge. And yes, so yes. Anthony Hewish, I think yes, it was. Yes. And Hewish and Bell. Yeah. And Jocelyn Bell. Yeah, yeah. Hmm. So they find a star that yeah. is that is blinking at us mm -hmm. in yeah. radio mm -hmm. waves. Yes. Yeah, which we don't have that word yet. Oh, oh. Excuse me. <laughs> it's not invented yet. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> right, a star is... So you were just like, look at the blinking star. Look at the blinking, <laughs> and it's keeping perfect yeah. time. Yeah, oh, yeah. my gosh. Yeah. Yeah. It, it might, and they, the, the famous LGM, I think, was uh, written on the page. Uh, uh, yeah, that's right. Because so, he, little uh, green men, right? It, it, it yeah. was so different from anything that was known before. Yeah. Yeah. Right, right, and that would be... That's an example of a signal. So, yes. so, we're, so our our history yes. in yeah. our field says, if you see a signal that is regular, yeah, and perfect, the ch is it is it just something we've yet to discover in nature that is regular and perfect, yes. or is it intelligent aliens sending us a signal? Yeah. And mm -hmm. the history of this is that it's a new phenomenon in nature. Mm -hmm. It's not a. Yep. It's not aliens, mm -hmm. unfortunately, because mm -hmm. we all want to meet the aliens. Yes. Mm -hmm. yeah. Wasn't it kind of, you know, when the humans spent a, sent out the golden record, they had like instructions on the side of how to... How to decode it. Yeah. yeah what do you think? What do you think of that? In fact, you were, you were also blurred by Andrean, who was the creative director of the record, yes, yes, yes. of the golden record yes, on the yes. side of Voyager. Yes, yes, yes. Um, so that just, I'd be curious yes. what's your thoughts. Mm -hmm. are. This is our attempt People yes. may remember yes, on yes. the side of just Google it, the, the mm. golden record. Mm -hmm. There are pictograms yep, on yep. the side yes, yes. that, of course, is not written in English, but yeah, they're yeah. pictograms yeah, yeah. that are attempt to share our science yeah, yeah. with them. Yes. Well, I mean, I think it was a good exercise to do that. And I think there's a, a plan for Anne to do a similar competition for schools to find something similar, mm -hmm. which will, to mm. design something. And that's a great idea. But um, I think um, the chance of any aliens picking that up and decoding it is far smaller than them detecting sort of uh, um, uh, radio and TV transmissions from the Earth. That are already right. leaking from Earth. They're already right. leaking, yeah. Um, right. And incidentally, there's some Because that's, that's emitting a, a whole bubble. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So yeah. wherever you are in any direction, you're going to receive this bubble, whereas otherwise, yeah. you've got to yep. be right in line with the... With, with that the, little yeah, tiny yeah, little, little voyager. Voyager. And some yeah. people say we should beam some signal, and other people mm -hmm. say we shouldn't do that, we should hide. And I can't take that seriously, because I think... If they're more advanced than us, they probably know all about us. They're probably watching us already. You think they're not bothering with us? Yeah. <laughs> but Martin, you, would, you wouldn't give your email address to a stranger who is human in the street, <laughs> much less the return address of Earth to aliens in the universe. We saw those movies. We know well, what they'll do. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I think they, they would know about us already. 
Okay. Yeah. I think the the, uh, the so, director. So we're signals. already a zoo for them. They yeah, already I know all yeah, about yeah, us. Yeah, yeah. They're more watching us with interest. Mm. A planet of, of interest. Mm. Yes. All right. Keep going. All right. So, um, so this is from Instagram. The C word, as in S E A. This is from Instagram. <laughs> is it more practical to research interdimensional travel rather than faster than light travel? <laughs> More practical. <laughs> well, I, I think neither is really practical in <laughs> case of our present What's more knowledge. more fun, do you yeah, think? Yeah. Um, but uh, <laughs> um, going, sending things at the speed of light, of course, um, is okay if it's information. And, of course, mm -hmm. one of the ways of, uh, uh, of sending um, information um, across the galaxy will be to send a code for DNA or something like that at right. the speed of light. Um, but, of course, as like, we go... It is your dad. Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yes. Mm. Mm. But uh, uh, so I think th those are uh, probably beyond the science fiction fringe. Although one should never say that because we've no idea what will be done in the far future. Hmm. We've got about two minutes okay. left. Mm -hmm. I want to make sure we have. I, I want to hear Martin's deepest, okay. sort of summative <laughs> reflections yeah. on where we are, mm -hmm. where we've been, where we're headed. Mm -hmm. Martin, mm -hmm. yes. What mm -hmm. can you do for us yes. here? Mm -hmm. Mm. Well, in my book on the future, I emphasize that this century is very special because depending on what actions we take now, we can either uh, leave a depleted world uh, with mass extinctions and an unappealing climate, or we can trigger the transition to a spacefaring civilization uh, where uh, human evolution will be succeeded by a, um, a post-human era which could spread beyond the solar system, indeed, through the entire galaxy. So the stakes are very high, and uh, the concerns are not just about ourselves, our children and grandchildren, but about the long-term future of humanity and of post-human life. But when you think of post-human, why can't we just think of better humans? So or, we have or, access to the genome. Now yes. I get rid of disease, yes. make you live twice as long. Mm -hmm. Yes, I maybe reduce the chemical inefficiencies in your body so you don't yes. have to eat as much. Yes. How about that? Or how about like well, humans that are already managing to do that, like indigenous communities who live in harmony with the with the earth? You well, there's one possibility. Some people mm -hmm. might like that. Some people might. I wouldn't. No, I wouldn't no, 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 no. Some people <laughs> might. You your iPhone. <laughs> uh, of course, some people might prefer to download themselves into something electronic. Yeah. Um, and um, and um, be be, fro be frozen until that era is, is reached. Wait, you'd rather do that than just like live in a city like Petra that's made out of sandstone where you get to have running water and beautiful life? Well, I think many, many people would. And, uh, and I think mm -hmm. they may not want to be more intelligent because there was this uh, attempt by, was it uh, Shockley, um, yeah. to set up this sperm bank for um, Nobel Prize winners. Oh my and it was rather yeah, great. He, he co invented the transistor yeah, yes. for a bell telephone labs yes, but then he went into uh, he, 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 into into racial thoughts oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, he, he said Let, yeah let's let's breed another race this is yes. very eugenics very yeah. but but, uh, but yeah. it's gratif gratifying that there was no demand good <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah but, to, but, but one fun thing uh, ray kurzweil he's a guy who thinks that machines will take over and he wants to be frozen uh, his blood replaced by liquid nitrogen until that era. And then uh, they bring him back and then he's in, and they, in the they, mix. They bring him back and uh, I, I don't go along with this. Uh, I, I've told people who advocate this, I want to end my life in an English churchyard, not a Californian refrigerator. <laughs> <laughs> that, <laughs> I love English people. <laughs> So practical. <laughs> yeah. I think we should end it on that okay. note, I'm pretty sure. Yeah. Uh, so, Sir Martin, it's always, it's a delight always to see you on the okay, well. conferences and mm -hmm. when you present, and I always yes. like tracking your books. Good. Yeah. So thanks for coming to New York for this. Well, and, and thanks, Neil, and congratulations on all you're doing to spread enlightenment. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I can't wait till like, other people are doing it, and then I just well, go to the Bahamas. Yep. Oh. Very good. <laughs> <laughs> right. okay. Martin Lisa's latest book, on the future, prospects for humanity, and it's a fast read, but <laughs> an important read uh, because the future of humanity lies in the brinks. And Maeve, good to have you. I haven't seen you, you in so long. Yeah, great You're busy. To see you. This is why I haven't seen you. You wrote a book, Maeve, yeah. in America. <laughs> yeah, going I love around. your observations of American culture. Thanks, Neil. It's simultaneously embarrassing and hilarious. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thanks for the chat. All yeah. right, you've been watching, possibly, most likely, listening to this edition of Star Talk, the future of humanity 
with my featured guest, Sir Martin Rees. Mm. I've been your host, Neil deGrasse Tyson, and as always, I bid you to keep looking up. <laughs>